Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Garrell, president of the CUNY Graduate Center, and it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar. Tonight, we'll hear a conversation between author Cal Rostiala, who is a Promise Institute Distinguished Professor of Comparative Literature, International Law at UCLA Law School, and the director of the Ronald W. Burkle Center for International Relations at UCLA. And John Torpy, Presidential Professor of Sociology and History and Director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here at the Graduate Center in the heart of Manhattan. Their topic is Dr. Rostiala's new book, The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Bunch, The United Nations and the Fight to End Empire. This conversation is an opportunity to learn about an extraordinary individual, a prominent figure in American and world history whose fight to end colonialism and to promote racial equality, equality was transformational. This event is also an excellent example of how we invite the public to discover and engage with new academic research in a wide range of disciplines. Our co-hosts tonight are two graduate center institutions whose missions are closely tied to this topic. The Leon Levy Center for Biography is dedicated to the study, celebration, and support of the art and craft of biography, historical and current. This unique center is recognized globally as a leader in the field of biography, and it sponsors a wide variety of events and public programs. The Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies, named for the man at the center of tonight's conversation, engages in research, graduate training, and events that improve scholarly and public understanding of international affairs, from genocide to transnational feminism, and that contribute to solving pressing international problems. Originally focused solely on the United Nations, the center was named for Ralph Bunch in honor of his accomplishments as a diplomat, a scholar, civil rights pioneer, and promoter of peace. I had the opportunity to hear from Cal in person earlier this week and know that you will all enjoy hearing about Ralph Bunch through Cal's eyes. Now, please join me in welcoming Kai Bird, Executive Director of the Leon Levy Center for, Bi for Biography. He will introduce our two speakers. Kai? Thank you, President Garrell. Uh, <clears throat> I think we're ready to get started. Yes, my name is Kai Bird. I'm the Director of the Leon Levy Center. And I just want to thank also Shelby White, who is our uh, major sponsor, who started the Leon Levy Center in the year 2007. It, it is her vision that it makes this program possible and all our other events. Please note that our next event will be on Wednesday, December 13th at 6.30 p.m. when DT Max will be in conversation with Adam Gopnik about the late Stephen Sondheim. Also on December 15th at 7 p.m., we'll be hosting a virtual event on Zoom with a panel of biographers about ancient lives. The panelists will include Francine Prose on Cleopatra, Peter Stotthart on Crassus, and James Rom on Demetrius. The panel dis discussion will be moderated by Daniel Mendelssohn. Please mark your calendars and register for this and our other events on the Leon Levy website. But tonight I'm delighted to introduce Cal Raustiala to discuss his biography of Ralph Bunch. He will be in conversation with John Torpy. Please look for these, events, these books online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Cal Raustiala is the Promised Distinguished Professor of Comparative International Law at UCLA Law School and Director of the Ronald W. Burkle Center for International Relations. John Torpy is the Presidential Professor of Sociology and History and Director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the Graduate Center. Uh, he is the author of numerous books, including The Invention of the Passport, Surveillance, Citizenship, and the State, and making whole what has been smashed on reparations politics. He was president of the Eastern Sociological Society during 2016, 2017. 
Cal and John will now be in conversation for about 45 minutes, and then they'll take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the chat box at the bottom of your screens to type in your questions, and John will try to get to as many as he can. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. On that note, I now turn the evening over to John Torpy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kai. Appreciate it. And great to have you with us, Cal. But let me quickly make one little correction that it won't be the chat box, but the Q&A box yeah. where, we will, <laughs> where we will ask the audience to put questions, which we will turn to at around 745 after Cal and I have a robust discussion of this fantastic book. Uh, I want to start off by saying that despite the fact that it's 550 pages, and I'm told that's short as biographies go, um, I really was unhappy when I, when I got to the end of it because of your skills as a biographer on the one hand, and also the fact that you've chosen you know, a terrific subject, uh, a guy with uh, an extraordinary life story and extraordinary uh, accomplishment in his life. And, you know, I happen to have the good fortune to run an institute um, that bears his name. So it's a great honor, really, to have this opportunity. Um, and I guess I want to start by asking you a question about you know, Ralph Bunch's trajectory, his life, I mean, in the broadest sense. And, you know, the fact that he became, he distinguished himself really above all as a kind of international civil servant. And this is a man who was born in 1903. In other words, he was having this uh, trajectory in the course of, you know, a situation in the United States in which Jim Crow was, you know, very much at its height. And so it's it's almost in a certain sense an unbelievable story that he has this kind of international um, you know trajectory and impact. So maybe you could just start by talking a little bit about you know how this man kind of got on this path. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I want to I want to thank uh, thank all of you for for giving me the opportunity to talk about this book and to talk about him. So. In terms of, of his trajectory, it is an extraordinary life that Ralph Bunch led. And you're absolutely right. You know, he was born into really the heights of, of both white supremacy and uh, European colonialism. And one of the three lines in the book, as I'm sure we'll get into, is the pairing of those two things, both in his mind and, and in his work, which I think was, you know, absolutely appropriate and, and, and a powerful connection that he drew throughout. But, you know, he starts off his life really with no particular interest in international affairs. And even when he went to UCLA, where he went to college, he he talked about it a bit and he took a few classes. But it was only really later that he starts to develop an interest um, in, in colonialism, which really grows out of his own personal experience as a Black man uh, in Jim Crow America and wanting to better understand uh, how this process of colonialism both unfolded, but also how it worked. Uh, and that led him to a PhD at Harvard uh, on colonial governance and uh, in Africa specifically, which was a place that was almost entirely colonized. Uh, and then eventually to, to the State Department and, and to the heights of international diplomacy at the UN. So uh, it's a you know, it's an interesting path that also in many ways follows the arc of the United States in the 20th century from a country that had, of course, a role in the early 20th century in World War One and so forth, but really takes off as as a global hegemonic power uh, after World War Two and and catapults itself into the very center of world politics and Ralph Bunch is there for that. So his arc traces our arc. Right. I mean, indeed, the relationship between, shall we say, the internal and the external is one that intrigues me a lot. And, you know, you make it sound in a certain sense like this is a natural thing to do. But, you know, it's, I mean, the rest of the world, the United States is a big country. I know my own path to international affairs and issues was not an obvious one. And so uh, I sort of wonder, you know, what really led him to think about these things? I mean, was his, his education at UCLA, which he reminds us, you know, was a place that was free when he went there and when Ronald Reagan wanted to start raising tuition rates, uh, tuition fees, uh, he was not, he was critical of that. 
Um, but I, I'm sort of wondering, and at one point he's critical of, um, you know, the sensibilities of other black intellectuals on this issue. He, you know, he sort of complains that it's sort of narrow minded and, and he's not happy about the fact that his boss at uh, Howard University is uh, complaining that, you know, he had to go to Africa to find a problem was, I think, the line. So I wonder, you know, th this is something I guess in some ways I associate particularly with W.B. E.B. Du Bois, um, but I wonder, you know, how do you see this in the sort of pantheon of Black intellectuals that he was very much a part of? Sure, that's a great question. And I'm glad you raised Du Bois because obviously Du Bois is a huge figure for 20th century thought, but also for Ralph Bunch personally. So Du Bois is quite a bit older. Uh, when, when Bunch graduates from UCLA, he has the opportunity to go to Stanford or Harvard and he chooses Harvard. And you know, of course he was an exemplary student at UCLA. That's why he had this opportunity uh, at a time when very few people went to college uh, and on to graduate school and certainly very few black Americans did. And so he does reach out to Du Bois at that time. Uh, and so Du Bois was always an inspiration to him, though, as I recount in the book, they have a falling out later, which you know we can talk about if people are interested, but he looks to Du Bois as a model. And so I think you know, from his earliest days uh, as a kind of intellectual, he's interested in the questions that someone like Du Bois is interested in. What does it mean uh, to be Black in America? What does it mean to have a global perspective on race? Those are things that definitely animate him. All that said, even well into his PhD program at Harvard, he is unsure about his, his PhD topic. And he flirts with different topics, some of which are really not actually focused on the international. But in the end, it is colonialism and the trajectory of Africa that really grabs him. Uh, and, uh, and it turns out to be his life's work. So, uh, you know, it's, it's fortuitous and, um, you know, he does a fantastic dissertation. He wins the Toppen Prize. You know, he's very, a very good scholar, um, but that is not his ultimate destiny, I think, uh, for, for, for the benefit of all of us. Right. Well, that's another interesting part of the story, which is that he seemed to simply keep thinking himself an academic who was just kind of on leave briefly, right. uh, you know, and over time he starts to be, you know, key, the key person in resolving or at least mediating uh, some of these major international conflicts. And he, you know, he keeps getting asked to come to Princeton and UCLA and practically every place else. And he sort of says, well, no, thanks. I think I'm needed here. So I wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, which is an interesting, you know, he, he almost in some ways seems never to really give up the idea that he's a professor, even though, as you say, he, he writes a lot. He doesn't actually publish a lot of it. So I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, yeah. So he was, you know, as an academic, I think it's fair to say he was pretty successful. He was he was recruited by Howard uh, after his master's. He hadn't even completed or really started his PhD process at Harvard. And, and Howard recruits him. And so he spends much of the 1930s back and forth between Howard and Harvard uh, and field work as well. Um, so, you know, he's always got a foot out of Howard. That's an interesting part of his experience there is he's never fully mentally, physically there. Um, but in terms of his academic work, um, you know, he was uh, someone who did pretty well and had a certain prominence. So he certainly could have stayed that course and and um, and had a an illustrious career. But as you say, he was drawn out of it eventually by the prospect of World War II and the looming perils of of Nazism, which, to his credit, he recognized early as a as a serious threat, uh, both to the United States uh, and, of course, to Black America specifically. And so he never goes back. And you're absolutely right. He does, uh, you know, repeatedly ask for leave extensions as if he's about to go back. But, you know, in, in his own musings at the end of his life, he he sort of recognizes that his um, his desire, I, I, what I view as his pragmatism, his desire to make a difference, to solve problems, really were uh, overwhelming. And that kept him engaged in a way that academic work never did. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while he did absolutely have incredible opportunities, Harvard offers him a position in the early 50s uh, and uh, many other universities, as you say, but he doesn't really want to do that. And and in fact, he's he's held back. I'm not sure he would have done it at the end of his life, but he's encouraged uh, 
uh, we can get into the title, but he's encouraged to stay at the UN because he is absolutely uh, indispensable in the eyes of many people. Right. I mean, there's another way in which he was involved academically in a project that was of huge significance in subsequent American life, had a huge influ influence in the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And that was Gunnar, I mean, we say Gunnar Myrdal's uh, An American Dilemma. Uh, and I really hadn't, you know, appreciated the history of that as, as much as you describe it. I mean, the fact that he was chosen precisely because he was an outsider, I hadn't really understood that. And I really didn't know that Ralph Bunch was a key you know, I don't know, his first co-author, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to describe his role, but it was a very, very important role. And he's apparently, you know, well known for having written lots and lots and writing very quickly and that sort of thing. And the Gunnar Myrdal project was huge. Um, but then, you know, World War II comes along and people start talking about something called the United Nations, which is not meant originally as the sort of body of the organization that we now know. Oh, but maybe you could talk about how he gets a foothold in that, because that's really what draws him into this trajectory as the international civil servant. Sure, sure. So, yeah, he did work extensively on that book. And you're absolutely right that it, it had a huge influence. Uh, you know, it's in fact that book, that project that first brings him to the White House. So I recount in the book his he takes a trip. He meets with Eleanor Roosevelt in 1941. They have lunch together. Eleanor Roosevelt doesn't really know who he is. But, you know, she she takes the meeting and is very, um, you know, interested in his work. But they do talk quite a bit about the looming uh, prospect of war, which is on everyone's mind. This is before Pearl Harbor. And, um, you know, they're like minded in their thinking about what this means. And so even before Pearl Harbor, um, Ralph Bunch is is very concerned about what's going to happen in the coming years uh, with the threat that's posed. And so he actually joins the Roosevelt administration uh, in what ends up becoming the OSS, which is the precursor, the Office of Strategic Services, precursor to the CIA. So essentially as an intelligence analyst, uh, and he's brought in and he's recruited in part because he is one of the only people who knows anything about what African politics were in 1941, which was colonial politics. Uh, and so he's recommended for the position, but he's very happy to do that because he really does think this is an important task for him. Uh, and then eventually that leads him into the State Department where, uh, as you note, the idea of the United Nations, the, the allies, as we would think of them, is taking form and thinking about the, the peace. What will happen after the war is beginning to enter uh, into the minds of, of the State Department. And so he gets very involved in that planning. Uh, and that really sets him off on the trajectory that frames his career, which is as a UN uh, civil servant and ultimately undersecretary general. Right. And his main concern really is, I, I mean, he's very concerned about Nazism as a threat. And to some degree, that differentiates him, I think, from some of the people that he was otherwise, you know, kind of uh, talking to. Du Bois, uh, for one. Du Bois in particular. I mean, maybe we should talk about the Du Bois, uh, you know, contretemps. But, um, you know, he's basically interested in, above all, in the problem of decolonization and sees that as a kind of as he sees what's going on in the United States as deeply connected to that. Um, and, you know, decolonization then kind of is in chain, so to speak, as, as World War II comes to an end. And really, basically, in 20 years, the world is transformed. I mean, European empire, European colonial, overseas colonialism is dismantled. Uh, and he plays a key role. I mean, it's amazing the number of places that he was in and that he knew, you know, by firsthand experience, which not everybody can say. Um, so inevitably, he was constantly being asked to, you know, take on these roles. And I mean, uh, you know, there was a lot of, even Eleanor Roosevelt seems to have been uncertain about the readiness of you know various places in the what came was coming to be known as the third world, um, you know for decolonization for self determination. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how the, I mean that's obviously an awkward thing to be saying about countries and was seen at the time as you know problematic. But uh, I mean the case of the Congo is one where 
you know, there really were not a lot of, there was not a lot of state infrastructure for right. Congolese to run their own show and things descended into, you know, chaos uh, pretty quickly. And Bunch played a huge role in, in addressing that. Um, so maybe you could talk about that problem in, you know, intellectual political life. Sure. So that's obviously a really central theme of the book and his, you know, his viewpoint on colonialism was crafted through extensive fieldwork, which was almost unique in the United States in the 20s and 30s when he does that. Uh, he really understands how colonialism works in a way that almost no one else does. And so, you know, one of the things that's striking to me uh, or was striking to me in writing this book was just how unprepared most of the world was for the fact that decolonization was going to take place. So, of course, it was a topic that was discussed. It was a topic that was part of the UN Charter. It was thought about. That word doesn't appear, but the idea of, of self-determination and independence as a goal was there, but almost universally viewed as something that is far in the future. Um, an example I give in the book that I think is very arresting is that when the UN buildings on First Avenue are put up, uh, there's about 50 members in the UN, and they have to decide how big are these buildings going to be. In other words, how many member states are we likely to have in the near future? And after thinking about it, they decide 70 seems like a good number. So they design the building for 70, and it opens in 1951, and uh, you know, within a few years, that is overwhelmed. And today we have 193, and, and even during Bunch's lifetime, we had almost 150. So no one sees this coming uh, in the with the rapidity that it takes place. So Eleanor Roosevelt certainly was one of the many people, even as a human rights icon, who did not really see it coming or think that it was happening at the right pace. So you're absolutely right. There's a vignette in the book about uh, this talk show that she had on WGBH, and he goes on, and, and she is sort of concerned about Congo. How fast is this taking place? And, and you're also right to point out Congo was ruled brutally by the Belgians, and there were only 17 college graduates in the entire country, in the entire territory, size of Western Europe. So uh, there is an argument to be made that they were not ready, but Ralph Bunch's view was that doesn't matter. Um, this is a moral imperative, it's a political imperative, and most importantly, the United Nations, in his view, was the place that could help make them ready, assist them, that, that the United Nations could square that circle uh, by um, providing the kind of infrastructure, bureaucratic infrastructure that didn't exist. Uh, we can talk more about how Congo doesn't quite work out that well uh, initially and, and maybe over the longer term, but that's his vision and, and he was really a believer in that. Right. And he was also a believer in mediation, which he was drawn into soon after the UN basically was actually created. Uh, and this led to his being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And this is for the early attempts to mediate the conflict between the Israelis and the Arabs. And I wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, um, you know, you have to be playing a pretty big role in a conflict like that to, to end up with the Nobel Peace Prize. And at some level, he was still relatively unknown. Yeah. But soon thereafter, I mean, of course, he's a kind of a worldwide celebrity. Um, so, I mean, this has a huge impact. I mean, you open the book with this great vignette of him awarding the last prize at the at the Oscars in 1951, I think now. 51. 51. He was all awarded. about Eve. Right. He was awarded that. Uh, he, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for in 1950. Uh, but maybe you could talk about, you know, because this becomes a central kind of theme for him or a, a central uh, concern and activity is his role as a mediator. Yeah, mediation was one of the things that really is a signature for him in his career. And he was known as a peacemaker. That was really what he, you know, I, I, I make the story of decolonization central because that was how he viewed it. And I think absolutely correctly. But in the popular imagination, especially in this country, he was thought of more as the sort of guy who had a magic touch in the crucial arena of diplomacy in, in the Cold War. And specifically mediation was part of that and, and the Arab-Israeli uh, mediation that he engages in in 1949 is absolutely critical. And it's an amazing story because he's, first of all, lucky to even be alive. The original mediator is assassinated on the streets of Jerusalem in an ambush that 
He should have been sitting in the car and just luckily is, is not. Um, but he turns out to be an excellent mediator, someone who was both charming personally, but also very strategic and uh, kind of mastered the use of both social and formal tools. So he was very good at sort of uh, getting parties to find some common ground. Um, and he does that. And so that really does catapult him from, he had some moderate fame at that point, uh, but really there were some profiles, for example, in the New York Black Press before he wins the Nobel Prize, because he's a very unusual figure to even be in the State Department or the UN at that point. But he is um, not known uh, widely in American society. And once he successfully negotiates these four armistice agreements, that's front page news all over the world. And then, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize just catapults him. Uh, he gets a ticker tape parade down Broadway. You know, everything changes for him. But mediation was a through line for him. And right up until the end of his life, he's actually asked, uh, 1969, the British want him to mediate the situation in Northern Ireland, which is entering the period we know as the Troubles. And so he's continually looked at as the guy who can solve almost any conflict. Right. So, I mean, part of what's going on is that the UN itself is trying to figure out what it is. And I think you use the useful kind of metaphor of, uh, is it a stage or is it an actor? And I think initially it was widely seen perhaps by people like Arthur Vandenberg, who at least earlier in his career was a kind of America firster. Um, but, you know, it's still trying to figure out, well, what is it exactly? And, you know, then this Congo crisis comes, I mean, there's already a peacekeep, pe peacekeeping mission that is created in the, in the response to the Suez crisis. Um, and then uh, soon thereafter in, um, in the Congo situation. And so maybe you could talk about a little bit about how, you know, that develops because, you know, it's not clear that you want this international organization necessarily to be uh, a gun wielding uh, entity, right? And there was surely has surely been lots of controversy about that, uh, about that idea. So maybe you could talk about, you know, how he helps kind of make that a key part of what the UN was all about. Sure, yeah. So peacekeeping is a really interesting issue that obviously transcends Ralph Bunch, but he was at the very center of it. And in fact, he, uh, in his own writings, took great pride in the efforts that he made for peacekeeping, viewed it as his biggest accomplishment, even bigger than what he did in uh, in Palestine. And so that was absolutely essential. But you're right that if you look at the UN Charter, the word peace appears about 50 times, but the word peacekeeping does not appear. So it's not something that was envisioned. Uh, and the UN, uh, while the UN having troops was envisioned, it was it was never implemented in the way it was envisioned. Um, the idea of peacekeeping wasn't how it was thought to play out. And so this was really an innovation and an evolution in thinking that was reacting to a set of challenges that just were not expected. And specifically, the challenge of decolonization was central uh, because so many states, as they gained their independence, as in the case of Congo, had inevitably unstable political coalitions that were brand new. New parties were cropping up. And many of these states, of course, had borders that were arbitrarily drawn by Europeans. And so different ethnic, religious, linguistic groups were sort of forced together. And so um, civil war turns out to be a really central challenge for the United Nations rather than the state to state war that people thought. And so peacekeeping is absolutely central to that. So Congo is a great example. So in a nutshell, Congo uh, becomes independent and within days there's a civil war where the most uh, sort of lucrative part of Congo tries to break away, mostly helped by the Belgians and Ralph Bunch is at the very center of that story and that does lead to fairly aggressive and large scale peacekeeping which had never been seen before. Right. So now we're getting into the 1960s and um you know, things are heating up on the domestic front, so to speak. And this begins to capture his attention, it seems, somewhat more. Um, he's also getting not, not younger and having some health issues and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, because of what's happening, I think, on the domestic 
seen, you know, he's starting to pay more attention to it. And this has obviously been a lifelong concern, although he's criticized by some for not being so, you know, involved as he should be, although that's often based on misunderstanding or mis misinformation. He was at the March on Washington, for example, in 1963. Um, but it's clear that he, you know, back to this sort of internal and external, he, he sort of clearly is in the camp I would say uh, of you know Martin Luther King, and is less um, close, partially because of an earlier snub from Du Bois, uh, with the sort of the Du Bois wing of you know black intellectual and elite politics. So I wonder if you could talk about you know why that came about, and I mean I see him as a, and you see him I, I think as a kind of ally of King's and somebody who Definitely. sees in King's measured, but, you know, slow burning radical way. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about those kind of um, relationships. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, throughout his life, of course, he was very interested in civil rights and quite active in his early years at Howard, as we talked about, uh, both as a scholar and as an activist, he was involved in the NAACP and many other organizations. Once he enters the State Department and then eventually the United Nations, he doesn't leave that behind. He remains on the board of the NAACP, for example, but he's not front and center and in part feels he can't be as a kind of international civil servant. He can't really be weighing in on American politics. And um, as you mentioned, once the 1960s uh, roll around and, and he himself is in his 60s, uh, he's beginning to kind of re-engage in a more public way. And he's very taken with Martin Luther King. They meet in Ghana. When Ghana becomes independent in 1957, King, Ralph Bunch, uh, and many other um, sort of black luminaries are there, as is Richard Nixon as vice president. And that's the first time they, they as far as anyone seems to, to know, that they meet personally. Um, and they develop a relationship. And of course, there are two Nobel laureates eventually who share that. Uh, that prize. But you're right to point to King's measured approaches. Ralph Bunch was not a revolutionary, although he, in a sense, was at the center of what I would consider the most significant revolution of the 20th century, which is the, the revolution of independence uh, for so much of uh, the developing world. He's not personally a revolutionary. And so King, in his moral um, power, in his belief in convincing people of the rightness of his cause, that really resonated with Ralph Bunch. And so he really allied himself uh, with King as much as possible. King in turn found Bunch to be someone who was like-minded of course, but also um, helpful because Ralph Bunch was uh, at that point an establishment figure with um, kind of contacts and relationships at the very highest level. Someone who presidents would call on the phone and on a first name basis. So. Uh, they saw something in each other. Um, we can talk about Vietnam. The Vietnam War does divide them a bit briefly, but um, they were very much like-minded and, and, and they marched together. If you look at photos from um, the march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, you, know, you see them arm in arm. So absolutely, they were, they were aligned and, and Ralph Bunch thought extremely highly of him. We have a big blown up picture of the march from Selma to Montgomery outside the suite. Um, that the Ralph Bunch Institute occupies. And it's something that I think about, uh, you know, his way of thinking about these things uh, is something that I'm always reminded of when I see that picture. Um, but as you say, he was critical of at least one move that King made in regard to Vietnam, one criticism that he made of the Vietnam War uh, and thought it was basically going to be uh, harmful to the interests of the civil rights movement. So this question of the internal and the external and how they meet is something that is clearly always on his mind. He's obviously a, you know, a, a very savvy kind of political uh, yes. tactician and strategist. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about what he objected to about King's I mean, because this was a big step for King uh, to, to go from, you know, beyond the civil rights movement into a criticism of the, of the war, uh, which, you know, obviously there were two major movements at the time. And I think the criticism was, you know, you don't want these two things, you know, merging, you want them to be separate. But let me ask you to talk about it. 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're, what you allude to is absolutely right. And so King gives, as, as, as some listeners probably know, gives a famous speech in Riverside Church, critical of the war. And it's a speech that King and his team spend a lot of time debating what to do should they speak out about the war. And uh, he chooses to, and and Bunch, like really the entire political establishment of the United States, every major newspaper is critical of King, or virtually every, is critical of him. Uh, and Bunch's view is that King is making a strategic error by uh, kind of marrying these two causes, which of course many people had married already, uh, either in their minds or in their activism, but that King should stay above the fray of Vietnam and, and, you know, I just want to make clear that uh, we can talk more about Bunch's own views on Vietnam, but he was deeply opposed to the war and quite concerned about it on political grounds, on moral grounds, on personal grounds. His son is drafted. Uh, so, you know, he's a lot of reasons to be opposed to the war. So he doesn't actually differ uh, in his own private writings, in his diaries. You can see that his thinking is very, very much aligned with King's criticisms, even if King maybe express them in a way that Bunch wouldn't have chosen. We weren't that far apart, but he really um, feels this is a mistake. So he publicly sort of chastises King and King is sort of pissed off. And anyway, they reconcile eventually over this and they and they work it out. Um, but it is this momentary rift, but it shows what you rightly point out, this external internal balance that um, Bunch himself embodied and the war brought together um, these issues for him in a way that no previous conflict, the Vietnam War, that no previous conflict had. So um, it was a it was a challenging time for him, for sure. Right. So I mean, some of what we've been saying, you know, revolves around Ralph Bunch's personality, and I want to ask you a little bit about that um, because I know you don't get to write about that in normal political science kind of books that you would typically write, uh, but this is a biography, and it does seem to me that you put a lot of emphasis on his you know, character. I mean, on his uh, reason, his, his sort of commitment to reason and and to restraint. And I mean, that's the kind of position that gets one in trouble with other people who want to move forward faster and that sort of thing. But I wonder if you could talk about, you know, it does seem to me to have been a, you know, a pretty crucial element of his rise and his you know, the trustworthiness that he develops with major figures and that sort of thing. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about, I, I mean, I don't want to get all academic here, but he reminds me of, you know, Max Weber's, you know, person who has the calling for politics. I mean, responsibility is a cr cr crucial kind of idea for him. Uh, reason is a crucial idea for him. Yes. Uh, so maybe you could talk about, you know, his personality and its role in his, in his you know, experience. Absolutely. Be before I get to that, just to mention politics, you know, it is just as an aside, an important part of his story that he is viewed as a potential political figure uh, for decades. In fact, JFK commissions private polling around how would Ralph Bunch do, for example, as maybe Senator from New York, a position that Bobby Kennedy ultimately takes. And Bobby Kennedy is concerned about Ralph Bunch's popularity. And so he never pursues that, but he he very well could have uh, and would have been formidable. But but you're right to identify his his pragmatism, his belief in reason, um, his his affection for a kind of cooler form of politics was really central. And in part, I think he I think that was always there in his personality, but it was really forged in what he saw in places like Congo where people like Patrice Lumumba uh, espoused a very hot form of politics uh, that Bunch saw as, I mean, clearly it was effective in certain ways, but he was quite concerned about the dangers uh, and the sort of violence that often directly flowed from, from speeches that uh, you know he saw as inciting rather than calming or uh, dividing rather than uniting. And so, uh, he saw that on the ground in Cyprus. He saw it in Congo, you know, many places around the world. So I think that did have a, a, an effect on him. But I think he was predisposed to see things that way. And uh, he was someone who really believed in the power of pragmatism, ultimately compromise, even with regard to Arab-Israeli conflict early on. Um, he thought that, you know, there was a way to find a middle ground. 
and uh, that could be done. And if you were just worked hard enough at it, you could do it. Um, so all of that was very central to his way of thinking. And I'll just end this answer by saying, you know, he also was, of course, an establishment figure. So he was a rare black man at the highest levels of diplomacy, uh, someone who every president from Harry Truman on wanted to bring back to Washington unsuccessfully. Uh, and so it's not surprising that he would also, in the face of that kind of position, you know, sort of be, he wasn't happy with the status quo. I don't want to imply that. But he also didn't think revolution or uh, dramatic change was the answer. Again, this is part of the appeal of, of Dr. King. Right. Absolutely. So we've been talking about this incredible guy, huge figure in the United States, internationally, wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, you know, ticker tape parade when he returns from one of his overseas uh, trips, um, but not well known at this point. I mean, not well known today. And, you know, okay, I have an institute that has his name on it. You go to a building to work that has his name on it. Um, but, you know, how is it that somebody of this stature is, you know, relatively unknown? compared to the people that we've been mentioning previously. I mean, certainly King is obviously a different, in a different league, but, um, you know, how would you explain that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question that I've sort of grappled with uh, in writing this book. Uh, and even before, you know, I, like you, uh, you know, probably have wondered, you know, what do my students know about Ralph Bunch? And I've asked, and it turns out not very much. And so, you know, even at UCLA, as you say, with a building named after him, uh, we have our own Bunch Center. Uh, there's there's not a huge amount of knowledge. I think partly his fame, the contrast with his 20th century fame and his 21st century, let's say, anonymity um, is striking. And I think it has been 50 years since he passed away. But I think the really key difference is in the 50s and 60s, when he was at his height, uh, the Cold War was a central part of American thinking, really global thinking. And the United Nations was a place that was imbued with substantial hope, and in fact was quite popular, even in this country. Eventually, of course, most Americans or many Americans sort of sour on the UN various times, but uh, the UN still had a lot of popularity outside of, let's say, the far right was already in the early 50s sort of concerned about um, conspiracies at the UN, but that was a fringe way of thinking. So his centrality to this critical conflict with the Soviet Union and the way that the world seemed maybe on the precipice of apocalypse uh, made what he did as a diplomat be absolutely central. Uh, by you know the 80s, 90s, that is sort of fading. Of course, you know I'm a I'm an international affairs person. I think these things still matter enormously, but they don't hold the same imagination uh, that they did at the time. So, and then the last thing I'll say is you know he was one of the few, maybe only. Uh, well-known black figures in American life who had a kind of tra a traditional professional career, uh, a white collar career. He, you know, he was a diplomat. He was a State Department official. He was, uh, he was an undersecretary general. Um, he wasn't Jackie Robinson, who was a close friend of his, someone who he admired a lot, but was famous for, uh, for breaking the color line in baseball. And so it was a very different thing. Today, of course, there are many more people like Ralph Bunch. And so I think his his uniqueness and, and maybe special qualities don't seem as special by our eyes. Uh, but he was really a pace setter in the yeah. 50s and 60s. Absolutely. Okay, why don't we turn to some questions from the audience now. Uh, and since you've mentioned Jackie Robinson, um, I think we have a question that kind of uh, speaks to the his interest in sports and its role in his, you know, in his working life. So a few, uh, Ed Chambliss writes, a, a few years ago, the recently retired NBA superstar Kareem Abdul-Jabbar spoke at the NYHS, which I guess is the Historical Society, about a book he had just written. He um, described how furiously colleges pursued him in the 60s when he was the nation's star high school basketball player. Uh, known, of course, as Lou Alcindor, playing here in, in, at Power High School in New York. Um, Kareem and his parents decided on UCLA only after recruiting visit, a recruiting visit by two of UCLA's foremost former scholar athletes, Jackie Robinson and basketball player, I mean, among other things, but for UCLA, a basketball player named Ralph Bunch. Did Bunch ever speak to the role of athletics in making him such an energetic and effective diplomat? 
Yes, that's a great question. Uh, Ralph Bunch loved UCLA basketball. And in fact, at one point, his his house in uh, Forest Hills is burglarized and uh, he's called. And after ascertaining that his wife, Ruth, was fine, his first question is, you know, are my basketball trophies still there? That was what he cared about. He didn't ask about his Nobel Prize. He asked about his basketball trophies. So uh, UCLA basketball was something he really believed in. He, he was a sports fan his entire life. Uh, and so, yeah, I love that episode. In fact, uh, he and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar meet again when Bunch Hall, the, the building I have an office in at UCLA, is, is built and dedicated. Um, Kareem is there. He's still Lou Alcindor at that point. Uh, but they meet at the dedication, and Ralph Bunch is absolutely thrilled. Um, but he did see uh, athletics and competition as central. So I think uh, it's not just his love of athletics. It was that he was a competitive person, uh, an extremely competitive person. And in his diaries and in his reflections, he made clear that competition was at the core of a lot of his success. Uh, and he sort of burnished that uh, competitive drive, uh, you know, on the basketball court and uh, previously playing football and other, other sports. Uh, you know, even when he talked about his academic life, uh, he he noted that um, you know one of his colleagues at Howard had described him his his work his his scholarly work as kind of having an athletic quality which uh, you know I think was not necessarily meant as a as a compliment and so you know Bunch saw himself as a little sharp elbowed and someone who wanted to get places and make things happen and that all fit with this idea of motion uh, that we associate with sports so for Bunch they were very um, sports were very important to him and also just a, a passion that he he never lost throughout his life. Right. So um, you've mentioned Howard now. So uh, we have a question about his Howard years. What were Bunch's Howard years like? Jay Garcia asks. Um, did he interact much with Alain Locke? Uh, I seem to remember Bunch showing up at times in Jeffrey Stewart's biography of Locke. Correct. Yeah. Or so and, Locke. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Locke is actually the, the one who makes that comment about athleticism. Right. I see. Uh, yeah, so the Howard years are interesting. So he does appear in Jeffrey Stewart's excellent uh, biography, which I really commend. Um, Locke was a bit older. Uh, they had some common interests. In fact, uh, Locke is someone who also is interested in, in colonial governance, though Locke doesn't really go to Africa to actually do the on the ground work that Bunch does. Um, but he likes uh, what Bunch is doing very much, and they spend a lot of time together. But, you know, Howard was a place that Bunch had mixed feelings about. So you know, as I talked about earlier, he was not there for a lot of the time. He was back and forth to Harvard quite a bit. He did a lot of field work. He spent time in Africa. He spent time in London. Um, he got a multi-year fellowship from the Social Science Research Council uh, to really learn anthropology. So he wanted to better understand, uh, you know, what political science couldn't offer. And so how does how do, how do cultural practices evolve and impact life. And so he studied with Malinowski. So he did many different things while he was allegedly at Howard. Um, I shouldn't say allegedly, but while he was, you know, nominally at Howard, he was actually off. Uh, so it was, a, you know, a place that I think he liked quite a bit, but somehow always found time to get away from. Um, so it's hard to say. And then later in his life, he had some, some less than salutary things to say about the experience of Howard. All of that said, he had wonderful colleagues there. He really enjoyed the people that he worked with. He was very dedicated to his students. He would go back to Howard in later years, both at the State Department and at the UN, um, to sort of go and show up in the men's dorm. And he, I, I talked to a former Howard student who experienced this, uh, who became a State Department official, um, one of the people I interviewed for the book. And, and you know, he would describe Bunch coming and hanging out and sort of smoking cigarettes and, and chatting with students. And he loved to do that. So uh, he very much believed in the mission of Howard. Um, but, um, you know, obviously he moved on to other things that we talked about earlier. Uh, despite many attempts to get him back, he, he never goes back. But it was it was a, a place that really forged his intellectual identity and allowed him to ultimately do the work that got him into diplomacy. Right. OK, so now another question with regard to his some of his connections with other uh, leading black intellectuals. Uh, Langston Hughes, David Abraham asks, Langston Hughes authored a rhyming couplet. I love Ralph Bunch, but I can't eat him for lunch. Uh, what was Bunch's relationship to Hughes, Robeson, 
at all and the anti-colonial struggle at home. Yeah, that's a funny line. It's often attributed to Stokely Carmichael, which is how I attribute it in the book. But uh, it's one that is, it's one of those, who knows really who came up with that line. It's, um, you know, maybe an easy one to think of. And um, Carmichael used it more, and he may have stolen it from Hughes, used it more as a way of saying, you know, you, um, I think the exact locution was, you know, you can't have bunch for lunch as a way of pointing out, it's not good enough whatever Ralph Bunch represents in terms of racial progress doesn't give us what we need. Um, but in any event, Robeson is the person he has the most contact with. So when he goes to London to study with Malinowski, Bunch ends up meeting Robeson. Robeson's, of course, an incredible figure in his own right. And, uh, and Robeson is taking Swahili classes at LSC. And so they get into this milieu uh, together and he's very taken, Bunch, very taken with Robeson's life. Uh, and um, you know his thinking, though they differ strongly on the Soviet Union. So at one point in his diary, he says, "You know, uh, Paul is all out for the Soviet Union," and and um, you know he can't understand that. And so I think to his credit, Bunch had a pretty good uh, kind of antenna, and he was able to see. You know, Du Bois. These are these are great thinkers, but Du Bois uh, is excited about the prospect of a colonial Japan taking over. You know. And Bunch thinks that's insane. Uh, and obviously, in retrospect, Bunch is absolutely right. It doesn't matter who's the colonial power. Colonialism is a moral wrong. Um, Robeson is so taken with the Soviet Union, but we know with hindsight that the Soviet Union was a brutal place in the 30s and 40s and onwards. So Bunch had a pretty good detector for those kinds of things. Um, but that said, Robeson and Bunch remain uh, in contact for quite a while, um, really until sign of the Red Scare, and Bunch faces a loyalty board. And, and by that point, Robeson is really kind of on the outs with many others uh, in the US who, who otherwise would maybe be allies who found him, um, you know, his positions to be uh, just, just too charitable to the Soviet Union by the time we're, we're, we're well into the 50s. Um, in terms of Langston Hughes, I'm not sure about their contact, but Robeson was someone he spent a fair bit of time with. Right. So uh, Michael Summerlin asks, say something, please, about his childhood and upbringing, his parents, what part of the U.S. he came from, etc. Also about his adult personal life, wife, children, the son who was drafted. Did that son survive the war, etc.? Sure. So he was born in Detroit, uh, lived briefly in New Mexico, uh, and then his mother passes away. His father sort of exits the scene a little bit earlier. And he's mostly raised by his grandmother. Um, and they move to Los Angeles, uh, where from sort of 14 on, he, he grows up. And so much of his formative years are really in Los Angeles, uh, which was a relatively small city at that point. Um, you know, it's growing rapidly, but it's still not anything like what it is today. And um, his grandmother is absolutely the most significant force in his life. He writes a long essay at the end of his life, just for his own consumption, never published, uh, sort of a dedication and tribute to her, um, talking about the many ways in which she shaped him and insisted that he go to college, which was something he wasn't necessarily thinking about. And of course, for, um, uh, for a Black man at that time was not something that was at all an easy path. And so it had to be pushed. And his grandmother did did push, did insist on it. So he put a lot of uh, emphasis on her formative role. In terms of his own personal life, um, he meets his wife, Ruth, while teaching at Howard. She was a Howard student. In fact, he had her in class, um, gave her a B, uh, and uh, she complains. And, you know, he he stood firm on that point, but uh, their relationship was forged. They end up um, marrying and then having three children. Um, his son, Ralph Jr., being the youngest and is the one who is drafted. Um, he does return safely. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's a you know, positive part of the story, but it's very stressful for Ruth and Ralph Bunch to know that he is off in Vietnam. And, um, you know, and by the way, on the you know, on the front lines. So Ralph Bunch, something I talk about in the book is that given his proximity to, to American power, his uh, many trips to the White House, you know, he was on a first name basis with both Johnson and Nixon. Uh, he could have very easily made sure that his son did not actually end up in Vietnam, um, but he doesn't do that. And Richard Nixon actually writes him a letter when his son is, is being deployed. And 
um, he resists the urge to do that. So that's another sign of his character and the way he thought about um, you know, what was appropriate and what was not appropriate, um, which is a difficult choice as a parent. So, um, but in any event, that's, uh, so he has two daughters and a son. One uh, tragically uh, dies of suicide and, uh, or an apparent suicide, I guess it's never really absolutely clear what occurred, but um, treated as, uh, as a suicide. Um, and um, I'll just say his his grandson, he's got an extended family. I've met many of them now. Several came to a talk I did this week, and it was lovely to meet them. And his grandson, Ralph the uh, Third, is someone who kind of continues in his footsteps and does uh, very similar work. And I was honored to have him blurb the book. And he's someone who I've, I've really come to respect as well. So it's a very impressive family. So it is. So we're running out of time. So let me ask you one last question, which is a kind of summation of all of this in a way. Uh, Lea Diaz asks, how would you summarize his most important contributions that can be relevant today? I that think are, that's a great that question. Wrong. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think his most important contribution is to, to believe in the power of diplomacy, compromise, multilateralism, the UN project uh, as a force for good in the world. And that through collective action, we can make the world a better place. That is something that he firmly believed. For him, the United Nations was a place that embodied that. Of course, he was well aware of its you know, many problems and frustrations, but he really believed in that. And, um, you know, I think his dedication to, to mediation, to peacekeeping, all the things we talked about earlier are all exemplars of that basic idea that through, you know, reason discourse, we can achieve a better world. And he really put his, uh, you know, in some ways, his own life uh, on the line for that principle. So, um, you know, maybe like many biographers, I've grown to really admire the subject of my book. Um, but I think those are principles that we would do well to remember in, in 2022. I think it's hard not to admire somebody, uh, you know, who you describe over 500 pages in this book. And I mean, I'm, I'm reminded, uh, apropos his sort of optimism, uh, that he gives a tour to Richard Nixon uh, of the building at one point. And Nixon says something like, um, this must be discouraging often or something like that. And Bunch says, uh, um, never discouraging, but often frustrating, which obviously is a fine sort of distinction, but one that, you know, speaks to his optimism about what this institution can do and what yes, like him can do. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, that came on the heels of him, of course, ribbing Nixon about UCLA, uh, football and basketball. And so, you know, it's a very bunch moment, but he did, uh, yeah, he did. I think he was getting at something important, which was, yes, of course, it's frustrating dealing with all these countries and the kind of bloviating that can happen in the United Nations, but I'm not discouraged because I am an optimist. And that was something that he said repeatedly in his, his life, that you had to be optimistic and you had to keep going. And he, he did that. Um, he did that throughout his life. Right. Well, in any case, it's a terrific book. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, thanks so much, Cal Rausiala, for taking the time to be with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, the book is called The Absolutely Indispensable Man, Ralph Bunch, The United Nations and the Fight to End Empire. It's available from Oxford University Press. And I want to uh, thank the Leon Levy Center and Shelby White for her generous support that made this event uh, possible. Thank you all for coming. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thanks so much, Kel. Thank you, John. Appreciate it.